Welcome back to the workshop. It's been a while and things have changed. First up, since my last upload, the white Duedo spider that's been in my shop for the last three years has been completed and sold. It's gone and off to a new home in Cape Town. In the end, that car turned out really well. It took a lot out of me to get it done, and sometimes it felt like it would never go back together, but after many late nights, it did. And before I knew it, I was handing over the keys and it was gone. Am I sad about it? No, not really. The history of that car is long and stressful, and honestly, I was just relieved to see it go. The other big change is that I totally rebuilt my workshop over December and January, and most of November. I've been in this workshop since late 2017, and although it looked good on camera, it was very rough around the edges. There are parts of the shop that were chaotic, like the Never Never corner and the stack of parts boxes up against the rear wall. Also, the shop was never properly insulated. It got super hot in summer and freezing in the winter because of that. So I decided once the duetto was gone, I would take some time to do some drywalling and maybe sort out the parts storage. And well, that was the original plan. This workshop refit may be the most extreme case of project creep I've ever committed. At first, I just wanted to install some drywall on the sides of the workshop, and I did that fairly easily. I made some wood frames, added some insulation, and then cladded it with drywall. But in the process, I made a huge mess out of the workshop, so I decided, hey, in for a penny, in for a pound, and I did all the upgrades I had in mind. At first I'd only planned to drywall the sides of the workshop, but the process had already made such a huge mess that I continued with the top of the rear wall and the front wall of the shop. The exposed sheet metal had always been a significant source of heat in the shop, so this drywalling and insulation made a huge difference on hot days. Hopefully it will help keep the shop a little warmer in the winter too. I also gave the walls a fresh coat of paint all around when all the drywalling was done. One of my bigger ideas for the shop was a new storage level in the front corner. For years I had boxes of parts stacked up against the rear wall or stacked on workbenches, which was just not an efficient use of space. So with a steel frame building, I figured it would be pretty easy to weld in a frame for the new storage level. It's topped off with some pine boards about 40 millimeters thick. It is 2.4 meters tall, 1.8 meters wide, and 3.6 meters long. So that adds up to about six and a half square meters of new floor space. This is where I store parts that I don't need in the immediate future. I stashed away some of my spare engines and gearboxes up there, along with a whole spare motorcycle and almost two of my GT's spare parts. Those two spare GT's were taking up a lot of space, so I decided to stack them on top of each other so they'd only take up the floor space of one car. The GT is sitting on a pretty simple frame that has wheels, and the GTV below is just sitting on a shipping pallet with wheels bolted to it, so you can move both this tall frame and the car beneath it around pretty easily. I also took the time to take my workbenches apart and fix them up. They were just bare steel and one was missing a wheel, but now they're painted in the same grey as the rest of the metal in the workshop. I've turned one bench into essentially storage, and the other workbench into a dedicated workspace. I also painted the shelf at the front of the shop where I keep my engine parts. This grey is called Phantom Ship Grey, and it's the colour of the steel frame of the actual building. I've used it around the shop quite a lot during this cleanup. I also built a frame for holding differentials, so they're not just lying around or propped up against the walls or in a corner somewhere. The old workbench at the front of the shop has been rebuilt to hold all the oils and paints and solvents that used to be scattered around. All that stuff is pretty unsightly, so it's great to have it behind closed doors. All the tools have moved to this corner as well. I've tried to get as many items on the tool board as I could. I like having tools out where I can see them. It's just easier to keep them organized that way. I don't like having things hidden away in drawers. Now that all this work is done, it's really great, but there were times I wish I hadn't taken the shop apart. But seeing it done, I'm glad I actually got into it. I have so much more space to work, and it's a much nicer working environment. I'm going to try and keep it as neat and tidy as I can over the next few projects. The 1750 GTV now has a really great spot with loads of space all the way around it. It's no longer jammed up in the corner with all the parts boxes, so I'm looking forward to getting back into the work on this car. And that's the update on the workshop. So I hit 35,000 subscribers recently, and I put out a call for some questions for a more up-to-date Q&A. They are here on YouTube in the community tab and on 
my Patreon as well. Fantastic news. More vids, more better. Here's our question. What's your favorite alpha color combination? Ours is mustard with a black interior. That is definitely one of them for me. The GTV project is going to be mustard yellow with a basket weave black interior. I have a particular love for cars with a brown interior. There's something about the tones of brown, like sort of caramel or like peanut butter interior, like I had in my blue sprint that I really love. And I think it works with a lot of colors. Obviously a color combination that I'm kind of known for is blue with a brown interior and that being like bluette or petrol blue with a tan interior was the famous color of the Sprint GT that I used to have. But I would love to have a car, I think, I really, you know, and the Duetto Spider was white with a brown interior and I think that looked really great. But I think a color combination like metallic gray, a dark metallic gray over a nice deep chocolate brown interior would just be beautiful. I, I really love that sort of thing. I'm not the biggest fan of black interiors because I think you're really limited on color when it comes to external color. So black would look great on a yellow car, but I'm not sure black on a red car, I'm not so wild about. Um, a combination that I would really like to try one day would be a blue car with a blue interior with blue carpets. I think it would be kind of wild. But yeah, I, I'd say my favorite color combination, blue over brown, that, that's my favorite. Which Italian classic car would you start with if someone wanted to start a new project? The someone has lots of experience with classic minis. I'd say if you had classic mini experience, the best Italian car for you would be the Innocenti Mini. But my real answer would be Fiat 500. I think it's when you think of 1950s iconic economy cars, you think of the Mini and you think of the Fiat 500. I think they'd make very good stable mates. The Fiat 500 as well has an incredible aftermarket part supply so it's they're pretty easy to restore because you can get anything you need and much like a mini i would also recommend the alpha sud however they're really hard to find even though alpha made almost a million of them or more than a million of them i think there are almost no alpha suds left and they i think they're really cool i like them apparently they handle brilliantly but um, I would say go for the Fiat 500 alongside the Mini. I think they're one of the most iconic cars from the 1950s and they would go very well together. I was first introduced to you while contemplating a bid on a 1964 GT Sprint in Greece. The seller linked your blog, Dargle to Dargle. Fascinating what you went through traveling from country to country across Africa. When do you think you'll get back to your hardworking Blue 105 that transported you on that journey? This is a really tough one for me to talk about because it is a bit of a sore spot for me. That blue Sprint GT is my favorite car that I've ever owned. And it is the one car I will never sell. And even if I had to sell everything, you know, I always said I would end up living under a bridge with that car. But unfortunately, it's in such bad condition structurally that I really had to take it off the road. And I do regret stripping it down as far as I did, but at least now I know what's going on. And I know that I'm going to have to spend an incredible amount of time and money getting that car back on the road in the condition that, um, in the condition that that car deserves, because it is my favorite car. And I'd love to make it a 10 out of 10, you know, fantastic car that I can use and do really exciting trips with again. But as it stands, it's going to require an entire new outer skin on the on the body and a lot of structural repairs. And I'm going to have to find an engine gearbox differential for it that will work very well together. So it's not an easy thing. But I think if I can get my act together and really get this channel going, I think within the next few years it will be at the front of the line in terms of projects. But that's another thing is that I have so many projects before it. I hope that I can eventually, I hope that soon I can get to a point where I can give that car the kind of attention that it deserves because it really is my most special car and it's the one that I have the deepest attachment to. And looking back at old photographs, I always think it looks so good, but under that paintwork, it was really, really badly damaged and really very, very poorly repaired. I'm surprised it held up as well as it did. I mean, it did spend two years outside through the European winter and out in the sun of the North African desert and on the streets of Cape Town and on ships on the sea. So it really took a beating in terms of weather damage and rust. So the combination of that and how badly it was repaired before, it is, 
it is bad. It is a really, really poor example of how you would want to buy a car, a 105 at the moment. So I am going to fix that car, but it is going to require a little bit of patience. Are you studying engineering at university? I'm sure Alpha would like to have you as a viable contributor. I would love to work for Alpha Mayo, like in any capacity, but, but no, I don't have a university degree and I'm not currently studying. I was never a very good student. I was always more interested in everything else apart from what I was supposed to be learning in school. I didn't get very good grades, but I did study journalism for one year and then I kind of dropped out because I realized that that traditional form of education in a classroom just wasn't something I was well suited to do. So I do like to think I've given myself a fairly good education since my high school years of working in the field of mechanics and traveling and reading. I read a lot and I listen to a lot of audiobooks while I work. Usually when you see me in videos with earphones and that's me listening to an audiobook. I, I don't have an actual university degree, but I like to think I got a degree from the University of Life. So no, not an engineer. Wish I was one though. Um, I wish I, I, that is one of my regrets is if I could go back to high school and um, pay a little bit more attention to the lessons and get better grades, that I could have gone to university and had a degree in engineering. I think that would be fun. I think I would probably have gone into something to do with maritime engineering if I had the choice. Would you consider restoring a GTV8? I think those were only made in SA. In SA. I think you're probably thinking about the GTV6 3 liter, which were made in SA. Um, there are a couple hundred of those cars around, and I have to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of the Alfetta GT and GTV just because of the aesthetics. Um, some people like that sort of late 70s, 80s, boxy um, kind of plastic interior aesthetic. I personally don't. I'm very much more into like the 50s and 60s cars. That is what I really like. I'm, I really don't like the, the the sort of 80s aesthetic stuff. Um, the GTV8s, I think they made maybe, I think they made either eight or 16 of them or something like that. I'll have to look that up. Um, I'm pretty sure that they are all present and accounted for. They were essentially Alfetta GTVs with Montreal V8s in them. And... I think that they are probably all in collections somewhere. And I wouldn't really want to do an engine swap to try and make a recreation of that. I'm not really into engine swaps anyway. I think, you know, if I wanted a faster car, I would just get a faster car. Like I'm not the kind of person who would take a two liter twin spark from an Alpha 75 and put it in a 105 coupe. Like, at, you know, at that point I'd just get a 4C really, I think. I like the way 60s and 70s cars drive, you know, um, having you know the kind of power where you really have to use your gears to get the most out of the engine i like that sort of thing i'm not really into the whole having 200 horsepower in a 105 coupe what is more important for you the process of restoring or the result you get this is a really interesting question because for me those two things are intertwined the process and the result are two sides of the same coin to me there are times where when i've been in the workshop a lot i just wish i could be out driving and using the car but then there are times where i've been especially if it's been a long time since i've worked on a car i get really excited about starting a restoration and planning out a car and imagining what the project could be when it's done but you know i think if i I've had some experience of being involved in the process without getting the result where, you know, that was from when I worked in the industry, when you worked in the cars and once they were done, they went out the door and you didn't see them again. And that to me was always less rewarding than working on a car where you had a purpose for it. So if I was building a car and like to build a car to drive across Africa, that was very rewarding. Um, the idea for me of like building a car to compete in something like peaking to Paris and then doing it, that's very rewarding for me. I think if I only cared about result, then what I would do is find a way to make enough money to pay someone to build a really nice car for me. But even the thought of that to me is just not as exciting as building a car and being involved in the process and then using it. So for me, the result without the process is not as rewarding and the process without the result is not as enjoyable. So I really, 
I can't separate those two in my head. I'm planning a road trip through Europe sometime next year, most likely into Scandinavia and up to the Arctic Circle. My car of choice is a 76 3 Series. It's pretty solid. I plan to travel period correct, so a map instead of sat-nav and only B-roads. I was wondering what your advice is on how to prep a car, what upgrades you recommend, and what kit you advise to take with you. I think a 76 3 Series is a pretty stout little car. I think you'll be all right. And Scandinavia is a very civilized part of the world, so you're never too far off from a Biltema or someone who could help you out. I remember breaking down in Denmark um, on the side of the road in the driving snow, and I wasn't stopped for more than five minutes before someone came to offer me a hand. So I think um, I, th- I think you'll you'll be all right. I would just m- say make sure you get your car in really good shape. Like do an oil change, make sure your oil level's correct, check your coolant, um, have a look around the car for any like worn out fuel lines or radiator hoses or anything like that that looks like it's about to give up. Um, you know, put a fresh set of tires in the car, balance the wheels, check your spare wheel. Um, I would say get some a toolkit with everything you need to, you know, make sure that you could put anything back that falls on and then, you know, make sure you carry some spark plugs and a distributor cap and a coil and, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, the things that will stop a car on a road trip are like usually carburetor related and ignition related. So between those two things, like make sure that you have the sort of the weak points on your fuel system and your ignition system, make sure you carry spares and they're really easy to carry, you know, like spare um, carburetor floats and like a fuel pump and things like that. Um, Carry that kind of stuff and you'll be all right. How did you get started in rebuilding cars? How did you learn all the skills involved in rebuilding cars? Do you do everything or are there some things that you wouldn't attempt and hand off to a professional shop? Okay, the things that I wouldn't do myself are things like paintwork, like large scale paintwork, like the outer finish on a shell. That you need really specialized equipment for, so I don't do that. And paint I find quite irritating, so it's something that I tend not to touch. It makes a huge mess in my workshop. Um, I also don't do upholstery myself. So I've got some good companies who I outsource that stuff to. Um, How did I get started? Well, when I was in high school, I was sort of, it was like of that time where video, video games were becoming like a really big thing. And I think I was playing too many video games and my, my dad in a sort of a moment of brilliance found an abandoned Lotus seven and bought it for me. And that was when it just sort of triggered this interest in mechanical things. Yeah, so I had a, a Lotus 7 in high school, which was great. And then when I went off to university, I was working part-time as a barman, part-time for an Italian car specialist who mostly did vintage Alfa Romeos, which is how I got into my first vintage Alfa Romeo. Um, it was while I was, working f- was while I was working for him. He had a client who had a 71 GDV um, that he was going to rebuild and then decided not to and put it in the back of his garden under a tarp. And he broke a deal for me and I you know, got out of there with a $1,700 GTV, which was great. And from there, it's just been um, sort of snowballing ever since. How did I learn the skills? It was I've been mostly self-taught with the help of a great friend who is an engineer. And he has been a very good guide in preventing me from going down a lot of like the sort of boy racer kind of things and trying to keep me quite conservative. He spent a lot of time with me when I was prepping the car to go across Africa. And I think that's part of the reason that car did so well was because I had his sort of conservative voice in the back of my head saying, you know, you don't need big cams. You don't need, you know, you don't need high compression pistons. Just do everything standard, everything standard. A car that's built standard, but built well will feel great. And, um, so yeah, I I do have to admit, I've had some good guidance over the years. Does subtly improving brakes and suspension on a classic car take away the vintage feel in your opinion? No, in fact, like these are the first things I do when I mod a car. I'm not so interested in like big power, as I've said, but a car that turns in well and handles well and stops well is a lot more fun to drive than a car that's sort of wallowy and, you know, 
like there's nothing worse than getting into a vintage car. I mean, well, there's, obviously there's plenty of things that are worse than this, but a terrible thing is when you get into a classic car and you want to stop quickly and it, you know, like one front wheel brakes much better than the rest of the car and the car darts to one side whenever you hit the brakes or you, know, you get a shutter up through the steering column because the discs are warped. And like, I think one of the best ways to get a car to feel great is like, get that suspension dialed in, make sure it doesn't wallow, make sure it, you know, or like the bushes are good. Um, just a really good set of shock absorbers and, and do the brakes. And you don't necessarily have to do big brakes. I always just say like for the 105s, like my go-to is just swap out the existing rotors for classic alphas drilled and slotted rotors and get some high quality brake pads. Like that will give you so much more bang for your buck than going for like the big, you know, over the top stuff. But yeah, that's what I do. Brakes and suspension. That's the first thing you should touch on an old car. What's your favorite book? This is a really difficult question for me to answer. It would change every day. I think, um, I, I read a lot and I listen to a lot of audiobooks, and it's tough for me to say like what my favorite book would be because I have to admit, I don't read that many novels and the novels I do tend to be more classics. So last year during the height of the lockdown here, yeah, I read Crime and Punishment and I really found that book moving and enlightening and it taught me a lot, but I wouldn't say I enjoyed reading it. Enjoy would be the wrong word. And I'm not sure I could call that sort of thing my favorite, although I'd say it was maybe the thing that moved me the most. My favorite kind of books. I love books like John Krakauer's Into the Wild. And I think I love that because I did a very similar sort of disappear into the wild thing when I was young as well. And that book changes every time I read it. Every time I read it, especially as I get older, my opinion changes on, on the, you know, Chris in that book. Um, he sort of goes from, at first, he was like my hero when I was in high school, the first time I read that book. And now I sort of read it. I'm like, oh gosh, this guy was a bit you know, a dove a dick to his family, especially to his sister. And, um, I really do like books like that. Um, I really love books like, um, travel stuff on good mentions on that would be like Paul Theroux's dark star safari traveling in Africa. I love that sort of stuff. Mark Twain. I know, gosh, reading Mark T Twain in 2021, like you should, isn't he supposed to be canceled by now? No, he's, he's a great writer. We'll keep Mark Twain around. He has a book called The Innocence Abroad, which is about a bunch of Americans in 1867 who get on a steamership and go to Europe and travel around. And it's hilarious. It's so well written and so funny. And his insight is incredible. And I, I really love books like that. Um, I, I'm not sure I could really name a favorite book. I think, I don't know, I also really love, um, yeah, like, classical novels, stuff like Evil and War, Vile Bodies, and Decline and Fall. I love books like that. It reminds me of my time in boarding school, I suppose. Um, yeah, I couldn't really name a favorite book. Are there other brands than Alfa Romeo you would like to rebuild? Yes, I, I'm actually interested in other cars as well. I just happen to sort of attract Alfa Romeo projects. I do have a Fiat in the workshop and some vintage Honda motorcycles. So those are the next things. So I can't be accused of just doing Alpha. Um, I really like Porsche. Um, the older stuff I think is really cool and, and very interesting and quite quirky, even though like I, I'll admit like a, a Porsche 356 is not as nice to drive as an Alpha 750, but they are quite charming in their way because they look like jelly mold cars i think they're quite amusing um i've worked on jags before i wouldn't mind building an e-type i think that would be kind of cool i would I, what i'd actually love to do would be to learn to work on more modern stuff i think that would be kind of interesting like i watch a lot of like um Tavarish and seeing him work on like supercars that's kind of fascinating i think yeah, I, I just think good cars are good cars. Like, it doesn't matter what brand they come from. I just happen to be into Alpha 105 because they are one of the greatest cars ever built. And once you get into Alpha 105, it's kind of hard to move on to other things because you just think, oh, it's, you know, there's not very much that, you know, can actually distract you from an Alpha 105 unless you're getting into, 
you know, the serious big money stuff. Like, of course, everyone wants to work on vintage, you know, V12 Ferraris and things like that. But um, in the world of realistic classics, it's hard to beat a 105. Actually, what I, now that I think about it, I would love an American muscle car. I know it's like controversial to say that, but like a 67, 68 Mustang, like fastback in primer gray or beat up with like no side windows in it and a big V8 um, on like Hoosier race slicks. Like that would be fun. I would like that. I would like a big, badly behaved, loud, you know, sun blasted American muscle car to tear around. And that would be cool. I would like something like that. What's your opinion on 916 GTVs? Do they behave as a real alpha or are they a Fiat rebadged? Uh, these are real Alfa Romeos. I love these cars. I think they are one of the coolest designs ever, and they drive very, very well, especially the V6 version. These cars, I think, are one of the most iconic designs from the 1990s. I don't think there's anything else that really captures that era better for me than a 916 TTV. It's so bold. And the fact that they have 24 valve, 3 liter Buzo engines in them is something that's hard to beat, to be honest. Um, these cars are also incredible value for money. I think I've met a lot of guys who want to buy 105, but they're really expensive now. And, you know, for their budgets, it's like you could get a really, really great 916 GTV and they look great and they drive great and they are reliable and they are a proper Alfa Romeo. These are one of my favorite Alfa Romeos. I'd say like after 105 series and like 750 series cars, and 101s like the next kind of alpha that i'm really into is the 916 i think these are like an underappreciated car at the moment and i would recommend getting into one have you considered the option of maybe converting one of the gts to an ev uh no it's not something that i would do to an alpha 105 i think the ev option is really interesting if you had a classic car that was not very nice to drive like a vw bus from the 60s or uh a Citroen DS or like an old Cadillac or something. I think then the EV option becomes quite interesting. But for an Alpha 105, I mean, they drive so well. I don't think you'd want to do that. And the environmental option, I don't know. I, I, I'm a big proponent of reusing things and keeping things and looking after them. So I'm, I'm very interested in old buildings and old cars. And I, I think like the one of the most environmentally friendly things you can do is continue to use something. And like, that's why I have absolutely no sort of, you know, I, I get people who say like, oh, you know, you're driving this old car. Isn't it very inefficient? What about the environment? I say, well, you know, this car was built in, you know, 1967 and I'm still using it. And I don't think like the, one of the best things for the environment is to constantly try and produce new things all the time and produce new things that don't last. I think if we're going to make anything, we should make things that are beautiful and that are built to last. So like I would always challenge people, like say like go and buy a really beautiful pen and keep it forever. Instead of buying, you know, 30 cheap plastic pens per year, go and get one really nice pen that you like and look after it. And I think we should do the same thing with cars. Like the most environmentally friendly option would be if we all just drove really beautiful cars that were built to last, that would be the best thing. But the EV thing, and I'm sure like electric vehicles are really fun, but I wouldn't want to take an Alpha 105 off the road in order to replace it with an EV version of it. I just don't think you would have much of an improvement over the original, to be honest. Right, so that's going to be the Q&A for this time around. I think I'll see you guys again for another Q&A at 50,000 subs, if I ever get there. I just want to say thanks again for everyone for watching and all the support up to now. I know it's been 84 years since I last uploaded. I'm going to uh, hit the ground running with a new series of videos now, so stick around. I've got a video coming up next week about rebuilding the underside of Porco, my 67 1300 Ti, and I've got some cool driving footage out of that as well, so look forward to that coming out in about a week's time. And I want to say thank you to everyone who has continued to support me on Patreon. It's been great. It really helped out with this period of rebuilding the workshop, having the extra funds. Unfortunately, after I filmed this, I had a bit of a flood in the workshop, but it's all cleaned up. So that's all good. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks again for watching. Cheers.